Good morning. It's uh, 7.31 a.m. on February 2nd, 2013. A very auspicious day, a sad day. Uh, well, not sad, but um, uh, memorializing day. Uh, it's an auspicious day because it's Groundhog Day, a day of repetition. Uh, it's an interesting thing we have about groundhogs and, and um, the seasonal nature of time, and that's basically what today's discussion is about. Uh, this is a version of Cliff Swujo, by the way, in case you haven't caught on to that. Um, my apologies for sounding like some kind of a uh, Frenchman talking to you in, from the bottom of a 55-gallon drum submerged in a swimming pool, but they've been spraying chemtrails uh, like mad the last couple of days, and those really affect my snout. And as I have a uh, Gallic uh, DNA, I've got a Frenchman snout, <laughs> so, um, so it's very badly affected. The thing about the chemtrails is this. It's an electrosmog. Whatever they're doing with it, whatever the point of it is, is immaterial at this moment. How it affects humans is that it comes on in and it coats us. It coats us uh, internally. Uh, it gets on the villi in the um, lungs, and, uh, or in the intestines. It gets on the cilli in the lungs. And it gets in the uh, crevices of the sinuses. I've been fortunate in being able to overcome some of the uh, drying issues that chemtrails cause. I noticed some time back, say uh, 1999, 2000, 2001, when I was running my solar observatory here, I w also h was monitoring things like um, uh, relative humidity using the wet bulb approach. Uh, that'll be meaningful to old school uh, scientists. Uh, in any event, I noticed that every time chemtrails were sprayed and they blew over us, we had anywhere from a 7 to a 9 percent drop in the relative humidity in a matter of minutes. And so it, it sucked the moisture right out of the air, did something with it, bound it up, and, and got it out of there in a just a shockingly fast way. So uh, my conclusion is that that same effect, if it's aluminum, barium, strontium, whatever, nanoparticles, they're undoubtedly um, uh, highly charged, they're alkaline in nature, uh, that's something that we haven't discussed in the past, but they're highly charged and so they stick to your all of your little hairs in your body, not only the external little hairs but also the little internal hairs. So they will they will stick to the little hairs that are inside your ears as you breathe them into your lungs, they'll coat the, um, the little hairs that move all the crap out of your lungs and so on. And so you get this effect, at least I do, especially in the sinuses with the coating and, uh, of the chemtrails after a night spraying that <laughs> you end up, like I say, sounding like some kind of a Frenchman trying to imitate a frog in a 55-gallon drum in, a, in the bottom of a swimming pool. And, it, and it's not good for anybody. Uh, plus, you spend 20 minutes trying to get rid of this stuff. Speaking of which, um, this is not medical advice, but there's this herb out there that uh, is extracted from the, uh, is it from a powdered, uh, root, and it's a uh, Strologus, um, Astragalus uh, uh, plant, and it is known as a uh, curative in um, Chinese medicine, what they call TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, also uh, Ayurvedic medicine um, for opening the lungs, and it really does work. It, it, um, now, you've got to be careful with it, though, because a, it is a highly effective. This is a true tonic drug in the sense that it causes a reaction in your body, a physical reaction. The physical reaction is that it excites all the little hairs in your lungs, and so they, they start shaking off all the little chemtrails and uh, the little nanoparticles, as well as any of the other crud in your lungs, and you cough it up. Now, here's the caution. It works, so you can't continue to take it. In other words, if you've got a nasty case of um, uh, lung issues, you know, from pollution, not from, like, disease. You've got to be careful about that as well. But um, you've got uh, dust in your lungs from sanding in your boat or, you know, something like that, going out and cleaning up your garage or whatever. You can take the astrologus and, and, uh, for that day and the next day. For it, it lasts about 36 hours, and in your system, its half-life, its effective half-life is about 36 hours. You'll cough. All the little cilia in your lungs will get extremely excited. Now, it'll also excite the villi in your intestines to a minor degree. Uh, it also is a um, bronchiodilator, so all of the little sacs in your lungs will open up more, and everything gets very excited. Now, that's the problem. If you take it too long, you'll know about it because you'll spend a whole day doing nothing but coughing. Cough, 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 cough. And it's a dry cough. And the reason you're coughing is because the little cilia think that there's a uh, pollution in your lungs that it's got to help you get rid of. Uh, so this, this root, uh, this herb does work. 
Now, you have to have extreme caution in even thinking about taking it, because if you're affected by any number of diseases, it's not indicated. So go and look it up and do your research and don't be a doofus. And uh, check it out on places like Wem Wem WebMD and a few others. And uh, look at its cautions and interactions and so on, because it can interact with any number of drugs and probably kill you quite dead, uh, considering the kind of pharmaceuticals that are out there that are people taking. Now, I don't take any pharmaceuticals. Uh, I don't take anything from Big Pharma. The closest I get to it is maybe I'll have a half an aspirin if my body really aches from a hard day uh, in uh, sanding the boat or Aikido or something. Um, that being the case, it's relatively safe for me. I don't have the potential for interactions except through any other supplements that I may be taking. And I'm very aware of this. I'm not a doofus when it comes to this. I used to be a doofus in the past, <laughs> and the universe taught me not to be a doofus. So uh, please, don't be a doofus. Learn from my experience. But if you do have uh, some of these issues, you may want to investigate uh, through traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. Usually, no matter where you are, you should be able to find one or the other. Uh, an Ayurvedic medicine practitioner or a traditional ch Chinese medicine practitioner. And they should be able to advise you on some of these. Uh, the, the issue, of the, the reason it's a tonic is that you can take it in perpetuity, uh, but you just can't take it daily is all. Now, ginseng you can take in perpetuity and you can take that daily if you're old enough. Uh, if you're under, uh, unless you're extremely debilitated and you're under 50 years old, you don't need ginseng. Shouldn't be messing with it because what are you going to take when you're older? Um, uh, you know, won't have the effectiveness then. Uh, so just be advised of that. But you can get over the, you know, uh, Cliff's mega snout issues here, uh, his um, uh, frog uh, replicating kind of things using the astragalagus root. Uh, occasionally, uh, you know, judiciously, effectively, and um, with some brains. Okay, so that's uh, just an aside. Uh, today is Saturday. It's the day that we learn that Ingo Swan is passed into the Bardo and is on his uh, next phase of his journey. Uh, around here we call that dying. Um, he was a good guy. He was really a, a tremendous influence on our world at the moment, and it is just really fitting that I was going to do the Wujo today anyway because I'd reached a level where I, had, uh, I, I have certain conclusions that I feel s um, pretty strongly about, and these conclusions relate to the nature of time and timelines. And I've got it all written out here. This is why it's going to be a rather long one, and I'm going to suck down some tea and so on as we go, go through this. Because I had to write down a whole lot of um, um, notes about how to present this material. Now, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to state some premises and uh, describe the assumptions that we're operating under, because we're discussing time. And there's very few things quite as slippery as time. Um, anyway, so. The cont and this all relates to the global coastal event, which we'll get to at the very end of this. So here is the contention. Uh, out and about in the planet, in the world, in the internet world, uh, in the world of alternative media and woo-woo, there is this uh, prevailing idea uh, that multiple timelines exist. We see this uh, frequently with, for instance, Courtney Brown when he describes the remote viewing ex uh, experiment that he labeled the 2012 experiment. Yeah, which you can find at farsight.org at the 2012 tab. Um, now, when you listen to Courtney, he describes multiple timelines as, in, in essence, being uh, infinite variety, infinitely available in the present now, uh, selectively uh, separated by consciousness, which means that he describes a situation in where he's uh, there talking to you wearing a red shirt, and there's another version of him also talking to another version of you, only he's wearing a blue shirt. And there's another version of him also talking to another version of you where he's wearing a green shirt ad infinitum. And so he's saying that basically all these timelines exist uh, simultaneously and they are um, just, you know, let's just say a hair's uh, width apart and vary only in minor details at that particular level. So that's the premise. That's what a timeline is. So he's saying that he's currently sitting there speaking to you from his red shirt version, and there's a blue shirt version, and I'm using this in the red and the blue pill thing, obviously. But he's got a red shirt version and a blue shirt version and a green and so on and so on. And so um, that is the idea of the timeline. Now, this is pertinent because he made a statement 
within his uh, 2012 um, uh, remote viewing experiment uh, that basically confirms all of our data for the global coastal event and also put it within a time perspective. And he made the statement that uh, some events are so large, uh, aka the global coastal, what I call the global coastal event, um, uh, that they, they impact all timelines, that they are felt across all timelines. And that his experiment proved that the universe uh, either operates in a function of uh, multiple timelines or pretends to. Uh, basically, it doesn't matter. He's saying it, it basically uh, is behaving uh, that way, and we can um, operate as though it does, even if that's not the case. And he designed a beautiful experiment. What I'm saying here in no way takes away from the Farsight.org 2012 experiment. It in no way invalidates any of their um, uh, research of any of the remote viewers. It in no way invalidates any of their conclusions. It does not reduce the uh, my confidence that we're going to be going through this global coastal event. In fact, it actually, th the whole point of this discussion today is to tell you why I'm so sure that there are not uh, different timelines and that his, uh, Courtney Brown's supposition and other person's suppositions that we basically wait to see which timeline we're on and to see how hard we're affected by this large mega event that's going to affect all the timelines is a spurious approach to things. And that, in fact, I'm much more uh, confident now that the um, Global coastal event will occur um, as a result of having gnawed on time here and recent events uh, as keys to what's actually happening around us. And I've taken the specific case uh, incidents within um, my life and, and uh, reality at large and placed them into a general case, uh, gnawed on it extensively for months, and have come to some conclusions that I feel fairly uh, strong about and, and are, am willing to put out there. Further, the reason the conclusions are important is that it reinforces the whole idea of the global coastal event and the um, uh, impacts we're all going to be going through as a result of which, which we're already experiencing. I mean, we've got to say that, you know, Sandy, the storm was a, a major uh, coastal impact. It was just not global, but it, it's part of the whole process of these earth changes that we're undergoing. So that's our basic premise that, um, that, that we're starting as um, uh, our point of departure in this discussion about time. That the timelines idea is actually prevalent uh, in the alternative media world. It's actually even uh, starting to gain acceptance in academic circles and fits into the idea of the Big Bang uh, theory of reality. The Big Bang Theory is basically at some point way back 14 billion years ago there was a single thing the size of a pea and it exploded and created all of space and all time and we've been uh, we're inside this now much expanded uh, sphere and that we're in here just populating it. Uh, further the Big Bang Theory supports the string theory and multiple dimensional view of reality. Now, I th happen to think all three of these are stupid ideas. Big Bang Theory is stupid. String Theory is stupid because it's related to Big Bang Theory and is necessary to support all of the things that don't fit the Big Bang <laughs> Theory <laughs> because it doesn't cover anything. It's totally bogus. And then the idea of multiple dimensions is also um, invalid. Now, I come to these conclusions because I've um, examined reality, and my premise is what I call... Okay, so l let me stop and state what we've just covered is the basic premise that... that uh, facilitates the idea of multiple timelines existing in reality simultaneously ad infinitum. This is not described, by the way, in Vedic text. There will be a lot of people that will say, oh, all the Vedic texts in Sanskrit and uh, Tamil uh, describe uh, reality as multiple timelines. And no, they do not. They, in fact, support uh, the idea of a single timeline theory, which is what I'll present to you now, and, and the rationale as to how that it comes into existence and why it is as it is. So let's start with the idea of the materium. Uh, the materium is all of us guys as consciousness all pressing together and creating, in essence, a giant aquarium and creating matter in that giant aquarium and then shoving our consciousnesses into some of that matter that we uh, animate. Uh, and we call these uh, living human bodies and other things, you know, um, living plants, etc. Even rocks are alive. Their consciousness level is just very low. Um, so here we are, we're consciousness walking around inside materium. Now materium is created, uh, if you want to call it an illusion, that's fine, but 
that would imply that there's some reality that is different from that illusion. There is something